liberalism section, the final and complete solution of the Indian and black questions. It was precisely Hobson, an author close to the liberal circles branded, quote, socialist by von Mises and Hayek, who effectively summed up the attitude to barbarians adopted by the West, and in the first instance, the liberal West, which was in the forefront of colonial expansion in the far West and overseas. The populations that were susceptible to, quote, profitable exploitation by superior white settlers, end quote, survived, while the rest tended to disappear or be destroyed. In fact, from the late 19th century, the theme of the inevitable disappearance of savages and peoples who could not be used as forced labor became an obsession. Articulating it were often authors who, at the same time, saluted the triumph of liberal institutions and ideas in the civilized world. In 1885, a book by a Protestant minister, Josiah Strong, enjoyed extraordinary success. His celebration of liberty, of self-government, of the right of the individual to himself, was passionate. He frequently appealed to Burke, to Tocqueville, Guizot, Macaulay, and Spencer. Strong and emphatic was his assertion of the primacy of the Anglo-Saxon world, which had the merit of quintessentially embodying both love of liberty and a genius for colonizing, that expanded the zone of freedom. But this expansion also entailed the inexorable, quote, extinction of inferior races. Albert J. Beveridge, a Republican senator and prominent U.S. political figure, argued in a similar fashion at the start of the 20th century. The homage paid to the Gospel of Liberty, the Sons of Liberty, and in particular, the United States as the country and people that were, quote, leading the world to liberty, went hand in hand with the assertion that, quote, a part of the Almighty's infinite plan was the disappearance of debased civilizations and decaying races before the higher civilization of the nobler and more virile types of man, end quote. A watchword even emerged that was to assume an unambiguously genocidal meaning in the 20th century, and no tragic success. While Strong invoked, quote, God's final and complete solution of the dark problem of heathenism among many inferior peoples, end quote. In 1913, a book published in Boston evoked the ultimate solution of the Negro problem in its title. Even in this instance, it did not involve an author foreign to the liberal world, and not only because he lived and worked in the United States, advancing ideas diffused and echoed even by influential political figures of the time. Far from regretting the abhorrent practice of slavery, he identified with the, quote, comparatively few liberal and enlightened men, or liberal intellects, who had wanted to abolish it when deliberating the splendid instrument that was the Constitution of the United States, the guiding star of the greatest temporal power in history, end quote. Nevertheless, in the land of liberty, there was no room for races intellectually incapable of participating in the superior, quote, Caucasic civilization and culture. End quote. In reaching this conclusion, the author knew that he was situated in the wake of Franklin and Jefferson. Happily, nature and the law of the survival of the fittest were already acting on their behalf. Afro Americans were being wiped out by tuberculosis, pneumonia, venereal disease, and other illnesses that confirmed the natural inferiority of this people. Quote, Few Negro children are born without scrofulous tendencies, rickets, blindness, or other transmitted evidence of ancestral infection. End quote. The ultimate solution of the Negro problem was in sight, and it would be a happy repeat of the already accomplished final solution of the Amerindian question. In the words of a Southern senator who was on the same wavelength, quote, God's law of evolution, the survival of the fittest, 
the extinction of the unfit is operating and would bring about a gradual whitening of the South and the United States as a whole. End quote. The touch of white already dreamt of by Franklin. In fact, the Indians had largely been wiped off the face of the earth. In 1876, to celebrate its centenary as an independent country, the United States organized an exhibition in Philadelphia that drew the world's attention to its extraordinary development. Along with marvels of industry and technology, sideshows exhibited, quote, wild children from Borneo, a five-legged horse, and wax figures of famous Indian chiefs, end quote. In summer 1911, in a remote part of California, an Indian was discovered who could not communicate in English or Spanish. Ethnological experts subsequently verified that he was a survivor of the Yahi tribe, largely exterminated over the course of a generation. The unknown, who refused to give his name or recount the history of his destroyed family, was put in a museum, where he became an object of much amused curiosity on the part of adults and children, all the more so in that the local press drew attention to the, quote, last aborigine, the Wild Man of California, a genuine survivor of Stone Age barbarism. End quote. After his death, his brain was conveniently preserved for further study. A great philosopher, Edmund Husserl, who was certainly liberal and democratic in orientation, observed twenty years later, alas, without any critical accent, that totally foreign to Europe and the West, the Indians, or rather the surviving ones, quote, are exhibited in fairground booths. End quote and end of section.